Father, thank you so much for uh, this beautiful church. Thank you for the things that you've been doing in our city, in Lehigh. Lord, thank you for giving uh, the faith uh, to Pastor David and his wife Katie to take huge steps in the last four years. Uh, they are an example for us of what it means to give everything to you. They are an example of faithfulness. They are an example of joy. Lord, I pray that you bless them, that you overbless them every day, Lord. This is just the beginning of ministry. This is just the beginning of preaching the gospel, Lord. It's so many years they are coming in front of us, and we are so excited for what are you doing. Lord, thank you for this marriage. Thank you for this uh, family, for all the kids that they have, Lord. Bless every one of them, Lord. Uh, Lord, that this family make history in the next years, Lord. Mm -hmm. And this is going to be for your name, Jesus, yes, for Lord. your kingdom, for your glory. Yes, Everything that happened in New Hope is for your glory, God. In Jesus' name, we say amen. Amen. Thank you. Wow. Thank you guys so much. We appreciate it. What an amazing time. Um, wow. We are celebrating four years as a church this morning. And it is truly exciting to see... Just what God has done the last four years. I mean, the last two years have just been, obviously, we've all been through it together, right? A crazy pandemic, crazy times. You know, we've, we've seen a lot of loss in the church. We've seen a, a lot of people come and go, and it's just been crazy to see what God has done. But one thing we were reminded of just in this last week and this morning is through it all, God has provided every single thing we've ever needed. All we've prayed for is the Lord would just continue to pay the bills. I mean, truly. And we, you know, if you've been here for a while, we, we speak honestly here about those things, right? And so we've, uh, we, we're just thankful that the Lord has constantly, constantly provided. He's so good. Amen? Amen. <laughs> um, and we just want to thank everybody who's come alongside David and I and Pastor Manny and Jessica and served. It's been an interesting two years. Um, and I've I just feel like we're so lucky to have the team and the family that we have here pushing through all of this and just running with us in this during this time. Yeah. Crazy, huh? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, we do have some exciting news. We have been talking about it the last couple of weeks, but we want to show you just a quick, quick video here in a second. We hope you guys enjoy. Four years ago, we started with a simple vision to love God and love people. Our heartbeat is to live out that message and to always put Jesus at the center. We've taken great steps of faith since we've begun. And now that next step is here. New Hope has finally found a home. It's been years we've been praying for this, and the moment is finally here. We are so excited. We have been praying for four years that the Lord would provide a final home for the church that we can continue to, to sow and, 
and just bless the community and be there for Lehigh and spread hope like never before. And so we are so excited. Again, as we said, thank you a second ago. We're thankful for all those that have been involved. We're thankful for all those that have been pouring into this church and into these people the last four years. This is truly the beginning of what you see harvest, right? Of all the hard work and the labor that's poured in and, and, and each and every week. I mean, guys, we've been setting up and tearing down for four years. Everything you see, setting up and tearing down. Yeah, give a hand to the team. It's truly amazing. If we calculated the hours, the amount of time, the prep work, the I mean, I go to Mike every week almost. We did it for a long time where I would set up a whole new background and stage, and we spend so much time building things. I mean, it's just been constant, constant, truly work just to get where we're at, and it's been so amazing to see what God has done. And so as we step into our fourth year, as you saw on there, January, 20, or January 2nd of 2020 will be our first service in our brand new building. Let's give a shout of praise to the Lord. It's been truly amazing to see, and we're just excited to see what the next year holds. And so every year we, we think, all right, Lord, what do you want to do this year? What are you calling us to do? And, and how do we move forward as a church? Well, again, in the next two and a half months, we'll be in that new space. There's going to be a lot of work in between, and there's so many ways that you can serve. So before we even get started with this, I, I want to mention this. If you head to the back, there's a connection table right outside where the tent is. There's so many ways that you guys can get involved and serve. It's going to take every single one of us to see this through. It's going to take every single one of us sowing, getting the soil ready for the harvest that we believe is yet to come. We know that God is on the move. We can see what happened in the last couple of years, but you know what? But we look at as a church when we see those things, we see an opportunity. We see an opportunity to spread hope like never before. We see an opportunity to come alongside our brothers and our sisters, to love on them, to care for them, to walk them through these pandemics, to walk them through the craziest times that we've ever been through. But we can walk through it with so much joy because of the hope we have in Jesus. That's why. That's why we get excited here at the church. Because we, don't, we know that no matter what's happening outside the walls, no matter the chaos that we see on the news or those things, we look to Jesus with hope and we go, Lord, we believe that you're going to do something in this valley and we're praying for it and we know this is the next step for you to sow and prepare for the harvest that's yet to come. That harvest, we believe, is people's lives radically changed for the gospel. Are you in, church? Are you in? With this, there's so many things that are yet to come, that we've been wanting to do for so many years. My wife's vision for the women's ministry and, and so many things to just pour into our leaders and our servants, it is exciting to talk about because it's things we've been wanting to do for so long. And now we have an, a great opportunity to do so. One thing that I wanted to mention on there that was super exciting was a mother's room. At first, that wasn't a thing, and so after talking with the, the owners and those things, they were able to, to allow that to happen. And so Moms, you get a mother's room. That's exciting. That's exciting. It's super exciting to, to be able to have that available and to bless every single one of you. So open your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 26. We're pausing on our current series in the book of Acts. We'll start up next week as Pastor Manning will take us on through as we continue through that series next week. But I, we had a vision night, uh, I believe last month, and we talked a little bit about this word that you see on the screen, so, so. And if you look at the dictionary, right, it's basically about planting. It's, it's laying down seed. It's laying down the dirt, right? There's, there's sowing, and the whole point is that it's preparing the soil for the harvest, preparing the soil for the plants, right, for something that's yet to grow. And so as we've been thinking through the year, you know, and as we had that vision night, I taught on this in chapter 26, but we wanted to bring it to the church as a whole so you guys can hear the vision that we have moving forward so you can see where the Lord, we believe the Lord is going to take us and what it's going to take from us as a church and as a unit, as a family to see these things through. It takes all of us involved to truly see something radical take place. And I know every single one of you are in. I can see the excitement. I know you're excited to see what God's gonna do. And I know every single one of us can be used. I wanna tell you this morning, do not let the enemy tell you that you cannot be used. You absolutely could be used for the gospel. You can. Even if you made a mistake last night, you can. Don't let the enemy tell you any different. There's so many people in this room that your potential has not even been touched yet. And God wants to use you. It's going to take more leaders than ever before. 
more people than ever before, willing to step up and see what the will of God is in their life and to see it through. As we mentioned earlier, what God starts, he also finishes. And we know this is just the beginning, it truly is. Take a look around. All people that you know, they're searching for hope. We have the answer, we have the antidote. His name is Jesus. If you look at Genesis chapter 26, it's an interesting text. It's Abraham, you've probably heard of Abraham, Father Abraham, right? If you look at the Old Testament, oftentimes they're saying the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, right? This lineage, this family. Well, Abraham has Isaac, and we step on the scene with Isaac and Abimelech. And in verse 1, it says, There was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. So another famine hits the land. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines, in Gerar. Two things to point out. One, obviously a famine, right? But two, he's in Philistine territory. And in this context, Philistine's territory is basically the enemy. So it's like us of a nation, we're over in a different nation, a different country, right? And they would be our enemy, but we're living amongst the enemy. That's exactly what's taking place here. He's living amongst Philistine's territory. It's not his territory. It's not his people. And he goes to Abimelech, the king of the Philistines in Gerar. Then the Lord appeared to him and said, do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands, and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham, your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So what did Isaac do? He dwelt in Gerar. There's a famine that's taking place. And when we're talking about famine in this context, it basically means there's, there's a lack of food. There's a lack of water. There's a lack of resources. You know, we've never been hit like that before. We saw it. And the first thing everyone bought in that time was toilet paper. What? Yes? <laughs> Who stocked up? Be honest. Who stocked up with toilet paper? Nice. <laughs> nice. You were the one. Just kidding. Just kidding. We seriously couldn't find it at times. It was crazy, Right? We all stocked up on toilet paper, but that's, you know, kind of the idea here. There was a famine in the land. No resources, no water, no food. There was a lack of these things. And so Isaac is in the midst of this. And I know he's calling upon the Lord, Lord, what do we do? Do we move out of here, the Philistine territory? Do you go back to where we came from? Do we go back where we know, you know, things are good? Or do we dwell in the midst of the famine? And what does he say? He goes, Lord, and the Lord says, no, 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 I want you to stay here and dwell in this land. And guess what? Not only dwell in this land, but if you obey my will in your life, I will be with you and I will bless you. Who would rather be in God's will than your will? Amen, right? And here's the thing. We see in the last two years, there has been a spiritual famine in this land. A spiritual famine in this land. We've seen so many people walk away from the faith. And it's sad to see, right? That in the midst when the world is chaotic, what we should be doing is clinging to the cross, clinging to Jesus. And it said we allow the world to speak in our mind and we walk away. But what does that teach us? It teaches us something. We need to check our foundation. What's our foundation? It has to be solely founded on Jesus. You hear me, church? Solely founded on Jesus, number one has to be. So he's in the midst of this famine, and, he, and the Lord's going, okay, in the midst of it, I need you to stay here, and if you follow my will, I'll bless you. You know, when you, again, take a look around, there's so much spiritual famine taking place, and it's hard to see. But in the midst of it, this is where I believe the church starts to rise up. Those that are in saying, Jesus is my king, no matter what's happening around me, my foundation is upon him. We need to step up and we need to love our brothers and sisters that are struggling. We need to reach out to the community that's around us and love on them and show them that there is absolute hope in the midst of a famine. Because we know when we're in the midst of this, it feels hopeless. Who felt hopeless in the last couple of years? Who felt it? who truly was like, what is happening? It feels like a famine. 
But Isaac dwells there. He listens to the Lord. And it says, because of Abraham obeyed my voice, my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws, he was blessed. And we saw Abraham blessed in so many ways. And he's saying the same thing to Isaac. Isaac, pay attention. Do what I'm asking you to do, and I will make all your descendants multiply as the stars of the heaven. I mean, this is crazy stuff he's talking about here. That I will bless the land. I'll bless every single thing you touch. I will bless all that's around you. Multiply it. Even, here's the thing, even in the midst of a famine. You know what that shares and declares of the Lord? He can do the impossible. You know what's impossible? Trying to find a building in this real estate market. That's impossible. But truly, God moved a mountain. And he allowed it in. We gave, here's the truth, we gave up. I gave up searching. I said, Lord, I'm done. Everything I look at, too expensive. It's too much. We can't afford it. It's just, it's hard. And one day I'm strolling outside the office that we are at. Just like this. I do this every day. <laughs> Ask my wife, just like this. <laughs> I'm strolling and I see this four lease sign literally the next building from our church office right next to it and it, the funny thing was it was the building we originally looked at it was the old police department Lehigh City PD they were selling it no one knew about it we just had a connection with the city and they told us hey we're selling this building I'm like well how much you know they're like 800,000 and then a week later it went up to 1.8 I'm all I'm out who has that kind of money like this is crazy ain't, ain't working someone buys it Next thing we know, we see a four-leaf sign. Literally just strolling, and I see it. I'm like, that's weird. And I went, told Katie, I'm like, there's a four-leaf sign over here at the building. I think they split it in half. Talked to Becky. Next thing you know, I walk in the back of the building, and I see this man named Dennis. He's sitting on a chair. He's on a phone call. And I just walk in. Hey, are you, are you leasing this building? Yeah. Who are you? I'm David. And here's usually the conversation. We're a church. Okay, bye. Usually that's the conversation around here. We're a church. We're looking for a space. We've been here for almost four years. What do you think? Sure. That sounds cool. Great. Here's the only thing you got to work on. The, the occupancy is only 49 people. Good luck. After conversation, he went to bath for us. Ended up being the occupancy up to 266. Woo. Yeah, isn't that amazing? So first obstacle, right, in the famine... Lord comes in, does the impossible, changes the occupancy of the building. And the reason why is because there was no sprinklers. But with the Lord's hand and using all those people of the city, they raised it. Even in the midst of it, he's moving. So the impossible happened. That was the first step. And then you obviously see what took place from there. But we see here in Isaac's life, you know, it's one thing to be told, all right, hey, I'm going to bless you. But then you see just a famine all around you. You're like, how in the world, Lord, are you going to do this? How many times have you asked that question to God? God, how are you going to do this? How are you supposed to, how am I supposed to believe what you're seeing here? Because all I see is famine, animals dying, not enough resources. And you're telling me there's blessing to come? That you're going to multiply? And what does he do? Okay, I'll dwell here in Gerar. For us, as I was mentioning it at our vision night, I was saying to the leaders and those that were there, it's time to sow. That's what this is speaking about, saying, Isaac, dwell there. Sow, prepare the soil, plant, and get ready for the harvest that's to come. I know it looks like there's, it's just desert all around. The famine is surrounding you but I need you to listen to me. I need you to step out in faith like we're doing January 2nd of 2022 and see my will for your life through. I got this. And when God says, I got it, and he says, move, what do we do? We move. We move. When the first thing happened of, all right, Lord, what are we gonna do? How is this gonna happen? Lord, the first goal was we need $50,000. That's a big number and something we've never done before. I've never tried to raise money before for the church. It's a weird experience. But as that happened, it was, we took a step of faith. The Lord just in two weeks 
has allowed us to raise close to $43,000. Unreal. Unreal. And so we're so close. So close. But here's what we're thinking too. Lord, if you can do it in two weeks, what can you do in two months? So we're like, all right, Lord, could we do 100000 Is that possible? That, Lord, you would just use the church and those around. And I told you guys last week that a pastor of another church in Arizona, they're, they're, they see the vision that we have here, and they're donating 20000 of that forty-two. A church in Arizona, have never met him in my life. I've talked to him twice on the phone. If you were here last week, you heard about this. I talked to him twice. I met him through Facebook, by the way. Seriously, Facebook. <laughs> Two calls, one call a year and a half ago and a call two weeks ago or a week and a half ago. And at the end of that second phone call, the next day he called me and said, hey, met with my leadership. We want to donate 20000 to your project. Isn't that amazing? I'm like, Bill, <laughs> you have no idea what this means. <laughs> Truly not trying to cry on the phone with this big burly dude named Bill Bush. <laughs> Just wait. <laughs> But that's what God does. When you see, Lord, how is this going to happen? He goes, are you going to listen to me? Are you going to stick around? Are you going to stay? We could have folded up shop a year ago, said forget it, and moved on. Instead, so many people sowed. So many people stuck it through. So many people looked to Jesus for their joy, their strength, their grace each and every morning and said, no, 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 no. The enemy is not going to win this land. This land is Jesus' land. And because of that, we're moving forward. Because of that, we're going to continue to sow and see what God's going to do. We truly believe, as I was talking to Bill, Bill's like, I'm praying over your church, brother, that by the end of 2022, you double. By the end of 2022, radically, lives are radically changed. And you're baptizing more people than you've ever seen in your life. Because he says, those that are willing to take a step of faith in the midst of a famine. What God is saying here, he's saying he'll take care of us. We believe that. And I hope you do in your own personal life. Maybe you're in a moment right now where you're, you're trying to take a step of faith. Or maybe you hear us talking about it, you're like, I want to serve. I want to be involved. I want to be a part of this. Take that step of faith. I'm telling you, it, no matter what's taking place, when you take a step, there's always blessing. You might go, man, I took a step and I got beaten. Well, maybe that was what was supposed to happen. Because I've done it too. And though it was horrible in that moment, I look years later and go, that was an absolute blessing in my life. So we're all willing to take a step of faith in the midst of the famine. Go down with me to verse 12. He has this weird moment with Abimelech and his and his wife and he says it's his sister and it's kind of weird and you're like what is going on and he just needs to trust Jesus it's just a simple moment of a man going you know what Lord I believe you but sometimes you know we, we lack that trust and he's saying Lord I'm going to trust you and then in verse 12 here's what happens again famine then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold and the Lord blessed him Isaac could have easily ran away in the midst of this famine. God, there's other resources, there's food, there's water elsewhere. I can take my people there and we would be totally fine. But instead, no, I need you to stay here right where you are in the midst of the famine and so. And when Isaac does so, he listens, he takes the step of faith into staying in the land sows and does what the Lord says, then God blessed him a hundredfold. Who has seen that done in your life? Where the Lord bring, brings blessing upon blessing and you're thinking, what in the world is happening? Why, God? Katie and I, in the last couple weeks ago, we don't deserve any of this. We don't deserve anything that the Lord has given us. But we're blessed by it, Absolutely. 16 years together, we're celebrating in April 15 married, no 14, 14 years married, sorry, um, hey, hey, I got it, 
14 years married in April, 16 years together. Five kids later. That's a blessing. And we've been through this. It's been a roller coaster because I'm crazy about ideas all the time. But God is faithful. And so we see that take place in, in Isaac's life as he's sowing, as he's, he's working. But again, as we talk about sowing, it takes work. It takes hands. It takes labor. It takes a crew. It takes a family. It takes a nation as they're sowing. But because of that, being obedient with the Lord, he reaps the harvest. So that's what we want to do as a church as we step out in faith, we want to sow in the midst of a spiritual family. We want to sow when we take a look around at the world and, and everyone's trying to sh shut, shut everything down and close up shop. We're going, no, no, no. We want to push through this. And we want to prepare the soil for the harvest that's yet to come. That's what we're all called to do. And so we see Isaac blessed in so many ways. As it continues on in 13, it says, This man began to prosper and continued prosper, prospering until he became very prosperous. There's three times there. What happened? <laughs> Did someone go, woohoo? <laughs> it is exciting, right? It's, it's, it's exciting to read. It's like, all right, Isaac, you, you were obedient. You listened to the Lord, and now we see what takes place. The man began to prosper, so he's doing well, then continued prospering until he became very prosperous. You know what I want to see for the church? Us begin to prosper and then continue to prosper and then be very prosperous. Why? So we can bless the community. So we can pour all the resources we have into a place that desperately needs hope. So we can pour all the leadership, raise up people and have them go out and declare who Jesus is on a daily basis in your life. When we do this as a church and we're together in unity and we have the same vision in mind to sow, prepare for the harvest, seek those that need Jesus, bring them the, the message of hope, bring them the message of the gospel, that's how we're going to change Utah Valley. That's how we're going to change Utah as a whole. But it's going to take all of us together jumping in to see it through. God wants to see, we know it, lives radically changed. And we have an amazing opportunity. It goes on to list these amazing things that Isaac was blessed with. It says in verse 14, For he had possessions of flocks and possessions of herds and a great number of servants. So the Philistines envied him. This is what's incredible. This is Philistines territory, right? In the midst of a famine. And they see a man over there named Isaac who's being obedient to the Lord, who they know loves Jesus, who they know is, is talking to God, who they know is, is following God's will, and they're envious of the things that he has. Why? Because they have nothing. And they're seeing this man being prosperous only because of Jesus. Jesus. Only because of Jesus. When the church comes together and is in unity, the enemy becomes envious. The enemy wants to speak against it. The enemy wants to spread rumors. The enemy wants to tear it down. The enemy wants to pick off people one by one by one to try to destroy what God has started. You could see it. He's envious. He looks and sees, unity? I want nothing to do with unity. I want to destroy. So when we step out in faith and we go, no, 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 we're going to step out in unity. We're going to step out with the same vision, the same goals to see a place radically changed. We know that the enemy is now going to attack, attack, and attack. It's been a good two weeks. But I know there's things around the corner. Because that's the way it works. The enemy wants to show up. He wants to try to destroy this thing. He wants to try to go, no, 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 no. I'm going to wreck lives. I'm going to create havoc. But we keep moving. We keep sowing. We keep digging. We keep preparing the soil no matter what's happening. Because we know and we need to get ready for the harvest that's yet to come. So these Philistines, they envied him. 
And in verse 15, it says, Now the Philistines had stopped up all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham his father. And they had filled them with the earth. So they, they know what's taking place, that Abraham, you know, he, he dug these wells out. And when you talk about a well, a well is very, very important in this type of society. A well brings forth essentially living water, right? I mean, it's, we need water in our lives. We need water every single day as humans to survive. And so that well, usually there's a lot of things that take place around a well in this time frame. But that well is what brought the water and the resources that these people needed on a daily basis. And so when you have someone come and they're filling that well with the earth, it's saying they're filling it with dirt, they're closing it up, they're trying to destroy what God had given Abraham. And oftentimes in our life, that takes place with us where we have a well. It's the, the water of life, right? It's the, the resource that we need. And the enemy tries to do this, pick up dirt and throw it in the well. You've probably seen that in your life. He tries to dry it up, dry up your relationship with him. He tries to dry up relationships with people. Why? To seclude you. To seclude you. Because he knows if you're secluded, if you're not involved, if you're not serving, you're not being a part of the local church, he knows that then he can start to speak lies into your life and you will absolutely believe them. And not only will you believe them, you'll start acting them out. It's what he does and he's good at it. He's so good at it. You know, for us as believers and for us that are looking forward ahead and go, no, 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 it doesn't matter about the dirt that's being filled. What's amazing about it is we can take that dirt as, as the enemy starts to throw that dirt on us, we can wipe it off and then just step up. Here's why. We use that dirt that the enemy wants to use, and what do we do? We start to build a foundation with it. We go, you can keep throwing dirt. You can keep throwing dirt. We're just going to continue building our foundation on it. We'll wipe it off, and we'll use it. We'll wipe it off, and we'll use it as a resource. Because what God started, he'll finish. You cannot get in the way, enemy. Not today, Satan. Amen? Not today. And so we see that as the Philistines start to, to, to dig and they're, and they're throwing you know, earth into the wells. They're starting to block them. It says, And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Why is he saying this? Because he sees God in his life. Because he sees God doing miraculous things. Because he sees a man in the midst of a famine having so many resources and every single thing that he needs to provide for his community. He's the source. And he sees God doing miracles and working. And so they say, you are too mighty for us. Go away from us. What's interesting about this is it's the same thing with people. As you start to see, you know, people be successful or, or maybe church working and, and growing and these types of things, there's oftentimes a pushback of go away from us. Go away from us. Get out of here. Or the enemy again stepping in and saying or trying to cause havoc within the church. Why? Because he sees that God is moving. He sees that God is working. And we, we see it in our life all the time. When God is doing something radical, when God is moving, the enemy tries to strike in every angle he possibly can. You know, when Katie and I said yes to starting New Hope, we knew instantly there would be a giant target on our back. Why? Because the enemy knows when, when people are willing to step out in faith in, in a way like this to preach the gospel to, and to build a church and to, and to love on people and love him, the enemy sees that as a threat. And so he'll do everything he can against it. But no matter what that felt like, no matter what that was, we said yes to the call. We said yes to Jesus. We said yes to what he wanted and the will that he had for our life. And when we do that and we step out in faith, God radically moves. You believe that, church? You believe it? He's good. So what we see here is, Abimelech saying, go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. Then it says, then Isaac departed from there and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water which they had dug in the days of Abraham his father, for the Philistines had stopped them. 
They stopped him up after the death of Abraham. He called them by the names which his father had called them. Also Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found a well of running water. So as they were trying to stop this thing, as they were trying to to fill the wells with dirt and cause a situation and a problem, they said, no, 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 we're going to continue to dig. We're going to continue to sow. It doesn't matter what the enemy's trying to do against us. We're going to continue on. And as they dug, and as they dug, and as they dug, it says Isaac's servants, finally, they found a well of running water. But the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen, saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Isaac, because they quarreled with him. Then they dug another well, and, and they quarreled over that one also, so he called it Sitna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth. Because he said, for now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. Then he went up from there to Beersheba. And if you continue on here, the Lord has a conversation. He says, the Lord appeared to him in the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. Isn't that amazing how many times we read that in God's word? That he speaks that over so many people's life. As we read through so much of the Old Testament, God's showing up and says, do not be afraid, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So what did he do? He built an altar there. What does it mean? Worship. He built an altar to worship the Lord and called the name of the Lord, and he pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servant dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar and one of his friends and, and Pitt called the commander of his army. And Isaac said to them, why have you come to me since you hate me and have sent me away from you? But this is what they said. We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. This is what God does, right? They, they shunned him. They pushed him away. And now they're coming to him. They see God's hand on his life. And he's saying, why in the world do you want anything to do with me? You tried to get rid of me. And what's their response? We have certainly seen that the Lord is with you. So we said, let there now be an oath between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do, no, do us no harm since we have not touched you, and since we have done nothing to you but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now blessed. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. Then they arose early in the morning and swore an oath with one another. And Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. It came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him about the well which they had dug and said to him, We have found water. We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore, this name of the city is Beersheba to this day. And when Esau was 40 years old, he took wives Judith, the daughter of Barry, the Hittite, and Basemath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they were a grief of mind to Isaac and Rebekah. What's amazing is, though the enemy was pushing against them and trying to push them away, they continued to dig. This is what New Hope's going to do. We're going to dig. We're going to sow. We're going to prepare that soil for the harvest. And yes, the enemy will come as he normally does. But as he does, we'll continue to sow. We'll continue to dig. We'll continue to say and praise Jesus in the midst of those battles. That will be our war cry. Because we know we're in the midst of a battle. But we're going to be prepared for that war. Because we know that we have Jesus on our side. Amen, church? Jesus is with us. And we know as we take the step of faith, he's going to do the miraculous and the amazing things that he normally does. It's mind-blowing. So my hope is as you walk away, that you're encouraged just to, to be involved, that you, you see an opportunity, you're like, I want to serve. As I mentioned before, there's so many ways to get involved. There's so many ways to serve. You know, we, from the very beginning, we've said this, what you're good at, what you're gifted in, we want you to use that for the glory of God. We want you to. And if you're struggling, I'm like, wow, what is that? I'm sure we can find a way to use it in the church. I know we can. Because we never want to see a gift unused. 
We want people to be used for the gospel. We want people to, to shine bright with, with God's glory and point all the praise and glory to him. My hope is, as we step into our fourth year, that we see just the miraculous take place and God move like he's never moved before. And again, thank you for everyone that has been invested in this. Four years, church, four years and 80 more to go. We in? Let's do this, church. He's good, he's faithful. Let's give him a, a shout of praise this morning. <laughs> Father, we, we look to you, Lord. We look to you in our life, Lord, and, and as we're talking about sowing, Lord, we know it is going to take hands. We know it's going to take work. But, Lord, we're here and we're ready, Lord, to be used. Father, we're here to be used in a mighty and powerful way only because of you and your spirit. Lord, but I ask, Lord, that you would encourage the hearts in this room that, Lord, if maybe they're, they're struggling with what their gift is or how they can be used, Lord, you show them right now. Or, Lord, they would come talk to one of us, Lord, and that we would start to see just amazing relationships start to form, amazing things start to take place in the church as we prepare to truly step out in a huge way in the coming months. But Lord, we know that when you give vision, Lord, when you speak to us, we listen. That when you tell us what you want us to do as a church, Lord, we move. And Lord, that's exactly what we're gonna do. We're gonna dig, Lord, we're gonna find those wells and we're gonna give living water to a place that needs it. We're going to bring living water to those that are, that are thirsty, Lord, those that are needing the hope that's only found in you. But Lord, prepare us. Prepare our hearts. Give us the strength we need. Lord, fill us with peace, knowing that you're in front guiding this thing. That, Lord, you're in front speaking, telling us where to go, what moves to make, Lord. And we're beyond excited just to see what you have in this fourth year of this church, Lord. Lord, it is yours, all yours. So Lord, we just ask that you would use us, Lord, in mighty ways. Father, bless those that have just been involved, Lord, and bless those that are gonna jump in, Lord, that we truly start to see, Lord, just more, more people willing to use their gifts for you. And that, Lord, as they do so and take those steps of faith, that you would bless them in, in ways that they can never imagine, Lord, because that's how good you are. Father, we give this morning to you. We give this year to you. And, Lord, again, as we take a giant step, we look to what you have next and are just excited that you're going to be with us in the midst of this battle. Thank you, Lord. Bless this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Can we all stand? Let's worship this morning.